Okay, great. So uh, thank you all for joining. I mean, more will come. I, I would like, first of all, to introduce my, my friend and mentor and good teacher. He's not older than me. He's only one year older than me, but he has uh, much more knowledge than me. Anyway, so it's uh, Kurt. Kurt is a geophysicist, uh, received his PhD from the University of Cologne in Germany, master from Colorado School of Mines, and also did some graduate work at Macquarie University of Australia. Um, also, he spent uh, many years as chief engineer, the chief scientist for Baker Atlas. And uh, then he moved in different companies. The most important for me is that he was responsible for all the new logging tools that exist in the most of the market. I mean, in Baker Hughes and other companies. He's also the pioneer of the LOTEM system. LOTEM is a long offset transient electromagnetic, and this is um, originally developed for uh, the oil and gas. And something that's important that uh, actually can integrate everything with boreful tools in order to, uh, to increase the resolution and provide good details, the best of the results to the engineers for the oil, gas, geothermal industry, and so on. So currently, currently, I mean, for the last, I don't know, 30 years, 25 years, uh, he is the president, the CEO and the president of KMS Technologies, one company specialized in the degradation of seismic and electromagnetic technology for uh, land and marine exploration with uh, projects all around the world, worldwide. I mean, from in India, in Asia, in the States, in Europe, Iceland, in, in, in Africa, so in many, many places. But at the same time, he has also, Kurt has also a distinguished academic career in Europe, Germany, in Asia. So he is a affiliated professor in China, Thailand, Indonesia, India, in Germany, but also in the University of Houston. And he has also supervised many postgrad students at the master level and the PhD level. What else he has, you received from me the information about his publication report. It's amazing for a guy who is in the industry and he is really far from academia for many years. Even he's always teaching, even he's providing invited lectures all around the world. He has published more than 200 publications, one textbook, four patents, which is very important. And if you remember the file that I sent you at the beginning, uh, he had uh, four patents all about the way that someone can use the electromagnetic uh, data and borehole systems in order to characterize a reservoir. So after, yeah, he's also a member of uh, SPWLA, APG, SEG, BDG, EAG, all the big uh, associations in the world. And after all, I would like to thank you, Kurt, for accepting our invitation. I welcome you in uh, our uh, class. So it's uh, our class about seismic imaging. We have also seismic imaging too. And as I told you before, I'm teaching the book of uh, Sekupta, your, your good colleague, your good friend. friend. And uh, that's all from my side. So the floor is yours. And thank you for uh, your presentation. Well, thank you for the nice um, uh, introduction. Um, and I um, gracefully accepted it because every time I teach, I learn actually more. And um, fluid imaging is something that interests me since the last 20 years plus, and uh, slowly it is making progress. So <coughs> <clears throat> I understand that most of your background is in uh, geosciences. 
uh, some in geophysics, some in geology, and some in reservoir engineering. Is this correct? Yes, yes. And um, if there is anybody else, you need to let me know. So I'll try to keep it simple. And um, I will even skip some of the more complicated slides about equations. Um, there are two lectures. The first lecture is going to be about Borel methods and petrophysics. The reason why I bring that up, because when you monitor the reservoir, you have to link that information to information that you know, and you really only know what's in the borehole before you start monitoring a reservoir. And monitoring a reservoir with geophysical techniques is very, very different than uh, doing exploration. And I hope I get that point across to you a little bit. Now, the second part, I will talk about the surface method integration and um, we'll then um, give you some examples from uh, CO2 monitoring as well, enhanced oil recovery. Um, and then if there's time, I will add some uh, future uh, developments to it. Um, and the reason why I do this is because KFUPM has an acquisition system which also measures the data for some of those developments. And finally, and that's why the introduction, we have a whole lecture on the introduction. Finally, I talk about the value derivation. How do we derive the value? Well, how do we check the results that we have? And this is very important. And there we again use the Borel methods. And a lot of the things I talk about the, in the introduction will come to bear um, and the value derivation. So there are um, three issues with reservoir monitoring that are important. Number one is we need to know where the fluids are and how they move. Um, and I use the word fluids because I'm talking about the reservoir monitoring in general for hydrocarbon CO2 as well as geothermal. And the second part is, is the reservoir safe? Is the reservoir breached and are we complying with the objectives? Um, and of course, that then leads to the rest of it. So everything is geared towards this and that's why I'm going a little bit through the background. So first I'd like to tell you that I have two websites I'm giving you access to um, and all of my students get access to it. And the first um, one is the learning center. The username is student EM book, and you may want to write this down. I will go to the website. In that learning center um, on, will be these lectures and uh, Pantelis will have to give me your uh, names and emails and uh, what you're studying and so forth. So you go to essentially our website, the KMS Technologies website, you click on uh, subwebs, and I can show you how that, for instance, looks by. Uh, this is our website. Log into restricted subwebs. Then you would click on Learning Center, which I've already done here. And then you put student um, and the password is um, is actually write the password down. Oil is good or lowercase. I would may, may ask you twice for that password. And this is the learning center. And in the learning center, you have the lectures, old term papers. Here are old term papers from when I taught these classes. Uh, some of the links are not perfect, but. Um, yeah. And sorry, yes. sorry for this. Can you write it down in the chat? I mean, the, the password. You can write it down in the chat. I don't have access to it. I only have two monitors. So the password is oil is good. Oil is good. Yes, one word. <laughs> no oil, case. oil is good. Okay. All kinds. And lowercase. Ah, lower okay. Lowercase is not capital. Okay. And then here are the lectures that I gave at different locations. And uh, if you click on the lectures, 
then they will come up and you can see all the lectures. Well, some of them on OneDrive. I don't want to go to those. Um, the smaller ones should be, uh, di this will be changed to be directly on the website. Mm. So this is the presentation. Ah, it wants me to sign in. Okay, I don't want to sign in. It takes too long. So I'm going to let you go to those links and those lectures because I want to go also through the other website. Uh, so you are on the learning center and you can get the lectures and you also can find out some of the papers um, where a course of a list of references and you have the references here and they get updated all the time. So, um, you can actually do something with this. Now, the other thing is that you, um, you can also go to the resource library. If you wanna have certain papers and publications, I collect most of the papers and publications in the resource library. And there the username is embook and the password is great year or lowercase. And then you get into a whole large number of references. So you don't have to do all of the reference search. Those that universities have of course access to this for free, but, but there's also gray literature here and they're alphabetically ordered. You can find those references and click on them and then the PDF file comes out and you have these references at your fingertips. This is very helpful when you write a paper. So I'm providing all of this usually to my students and, um, and uh, Professor Sopios has the passwords for you. Um, the case for the username doesn't matter and the passwords are all lowercase. All right, so um, first let's talk about the difference between using geoscience for um, exploration and production. So when you do exploration, you start with the physical properties of the reservoir you are looking at. And the physical properties is what you think they are going to be and where there is oil, but you have to have an idea of what you want to do. And what you end up with is the subsurface image. And you want to get the subsurface image either to drill a location or to better understand it and do more work and do a risk reduction and start out defining the value of the reservoir so you can justify the expenditure. Now, um, there are several ways to do this. One way to do it is what the reservoir engineers do. You acquire well logs and core data and field data. And from this, any smart geologist will clearly come up with a straight path to the subsurface image. But the geophysicists do all of these complicated things that are happening on the screen. They do measurements, they get field data, they process the data, and they do an interpretation and of course, this whole geophysics screen, screen red is a multi-billion dollar industry. And you can replace that with one smart reservoir engineer or geologist who goes straight from this image by just looking at the data to the straight from this data by just looking at it and the data itself to the subsurface image. So we are trying to objectivate this more and more by developing processes in doing it. But the reality is that an experienced geologist or geoscientist or reservoir engineer can solve these problems in many cases without all of that. So we have uh, borehole data and surface data. And our job in geophysics should be to establish the link. While geophysics has done a great job in finding more oil, geophysics has done a poor job in linking to the the borehole data, except for borehole geophysics. There's a small discipline in geophysics called borehole geophysics, which includes seismic and other borehole methods, and they are trying to make that linkage. Now in monitoring, the situation is very different. 
we start off with surface repeat data. We have a borehole data. First, we have a borehole baseline. This animation is backwards. And then we have surface repeat data. And then we are trying to answer questions like in the CO2, in the carbon um, dioxide storage case, um, is the carbon dioxide contained in the subsurface or does it leak back to the surface? And we want to get a dynamic image so we can see this leakage. We want to get the size of the injected uh, carbon dioxide and um, we uh, want to see if it's compliant. Um, to check this, we do borehole repeat measurements, but a borehole itself only samples 10 to the minus 13 of the reservoir. So we really need to use geophysics to go into the larger environment. The key question that we need to answer, how do we verify that this is correct? So um, this lecture will show you how you can tie surface electromagnetic data to borehole data and get borehole scale resolution. And um, so we are looking at the surface data, we measure the surface data and it ties to the surface repeat data. We constantly have to tie it to the verification process. And this comes from the borehole data. And then at the end, after we have the surface repeat data and we derive an image, we have to have a variation image that tells us about the compliance. Again, we have surface data and borehole data. Again, we are linking it with borehole geophysics. So the linkage is very important. Now, I started out making this diagram about 10, 15 years ago. And I have to tell you, unfortunately, that the progress we as an industry worldwide have made towards this is very poor. So what is the difference? Does anybody see the difference? Unmute your microphone and speak up. I always do this. I never let you sleep during the lecture. So what's the difference between these two diagrams? Can somebody say this in two or three sentences? Come on, guys. You must allow them to use a microphone. Please use your microphone. They will be ready for your next question. Go on. Okay, so now what are we looking at in terms of petrophysics? In petro terms of petrophysics, we are looking at um, physical parameters, reservoir parameters, also known as petrophysical parameters. And these uh, petrophysical parameters are different from the measurement parameters. So the measurement parameters are resistivities. The petrophysical parameters are water saturation or oil saturation or CO2 saturation. And so we are trying to go from physical parameters, which is resistivities that we measure, to petrophysical parameters, which are water saturation. Now, here's another way to describe petrophysical parameters. You look at a scanning electrode microscope image on the left, and you can see here the grains, but you can also see the pore space. The volume fraction inside a rock is known as porosity, and porosity is a number. 0 0.2 porosity, that's 20% porosity. So that means uh, uh, 0 0.2 volume fraction of the pore space is open and fluid filled. Permeability is the flow of the fluids through that pore of uh, reservoir. So the way the fluids flow through these channels or pore throats uh, gives, is measured in terms of permeability. Permeability is measured in millidarcies. Um, I will not explain that in this lecture. You can look that up, what millidarcy is, which is a measure of the flow through the pore space. And then, of course, there is more than just the fluids. There's also the interaction between the fluids and the rock itself, and that is governed by the specific surface. And the specific surface is the part of the surface of the grain, like here, 
that is exposed to the fluid. I've picked this grain for a reason because this grain is not exposed to the fluids right here. There it is exposed to more grains. So the specific surface is the effective surface that is actually in contact and is influence of the overall bulk resistivity. So those of you who don't like equations and complicated things, you can sleep the, uh, through the next uh, 10 slides because I'll explain all of this in a little bit more detail. So here we are now looking at things already going to a bigger scale. Um, the total scale here is 10 centimeters. We have grain sorting and the small grains at the bottom and then there are the larger rocks and pebbles above. And this grain sorting causes some sort of layering. So layering is inherent for any type of depositional environment. You have the depositional environment, which is known as transgression. So the water comes in and sits over the um, rock and the deposits get slowly um, uh, settled at the bottom, like in fine sand or dunes. Um, that also causes layering. And this is a typical layering as the deposits are coming from the mountainside where you have pebbles and things like this that are carried, carried by um, gravity or by the rivers. And then you have this type of grain sorting, but you still have to have it uh, submerged in fluids, uh, partially buoyant so that the sorting can actually happen. So this is very important to understand because this causes anisotropy and anisotropy uh, we will mention many times now. And um, so let me tell you what anisotropy is and how we define anisotropy. We have a physical parameter of a rock, resistivity or density or seismic velocity. Seismic velocity is essentially the speed with which um, uh, earthquake waves travel through a rock. So if this parameter, with depths does not vary. That means this parameter is the same in all directions with depths. We call this rock isotropic homogeneous. Most models that are being used in the industry use isotropic one-dimensional models. That is bad. And you'll see in a minute why. Now we have essentially, this is a sandstone model. You have sands, grains, quartzite suspended in a liquid equally, and it does, gravity doesn't uh, affect it. And you have them all equally distributed. On the right side, you now add gravity to it, gravity to it. And so you have more quartz grains located at the bottom. So what you have here is the top where they are nicely evenly suspended, it's isotropic, and then it changes. The vertical parameter, which in this case density, is getting larger, and at the bottom it's different. So here we have isotropic inhomogeneous. So it's isotropic in each of these, but it's inhomogeneous because with steps you add gravity to it, and here the rock gets denser with depths. Now, if you are not studying geosciences, you would say, duh, I don't have to go to university to know this. This is very obvious. Of course it's obvious, but we have to make models to understand the data we are acquiring. So now we have, um, anisotropic homogeneous and anisotropic means like we are adding shales to it. Now shales are often marine um, environment uh, depositions uh, mixed with um, mountain debris and they're making um, uh, organic shales or mineral rich shales and they are tight layers. And we have these here, but they're homogeneous. That means we don't apply gravity with depths, they are the same. And this means that in the vertical direction, 
the parameters are different than in the horizontal direction. And we are talking again, resistivity, density, velocity. A more realistic model is an anisotropic inhomogeneous. So now we're putting a bunch of rock on top of rock, we put weight on it, we compact it, and we are making the shear layers denser at the bottom. And they are not so dense at the top. So the parameters are smaller at the top and the parameters are larger at the bottom and they're different in horizontal and vertical direction. This is anisotropic inhomogeneous. This is also known as transverse isotropic. That means in the horizontal direction, they are the same at each depth, but in a vertical direction, they are different. Ker, can I ask something? Yes. Because you said that usually the industry use the first isotropic and homogeneous, which is the simplest. I mean, you know, a 1D model. Uh, but for example, I've seen some, some of the work, some of the preliminary models, the initial models they used, especially for seismic, especially for the removal of the sad unit effects and trying to understand the homogeneity. They are using a velocity model increasing with depth. So the compaction, you, you, the, since we are talking about grainy materials, you can just assume that it's, it's isotropic, but in homogeneous, where the velocity increases with depth. So, you know, that, to tell you the truth, I, I find it's fine. I mean, you know, it's for, for, a, for a survey. You're, you're, con you're confirming exactly what I said is, um, First of all, there's a lot of work being done and between researchers and publications using something and actually being applied are two different things. So uh, the industry, I mean, applied in the field. When you have new technology, it usually gets tested in 10, 15 reservoirs before it becomes part of the routine workflow. Now, what you are referring to is the wichert herglotz equation where the seismic velocity increases with steps which would be essentially in uh, isotropic inhomogeneous. Yes. Uh, that's just a minor improve. It's just a minor improvement. It's not realistic. Um, yes, that's being used because the equations are simple. In fact, I programmed that in uh, 1976 on a Wang computer, which had 256 bytes memory. Uh, so you can do that very simple. Um, but doing things more complicated becomes more complicated. But putting that in routine production um, is a different story. Now today, to give you an example, logging while drilling geosteering, which is used for more than 70% of the wells worldwide, um, uses still one-dimensional models to interpret the data. We know from day one that you can only interpret the data with three-dimensional models because the models, because the error is 30 to 50%. But one-dimensional models work very well, and that's why people are still using it. So you need to understand here the difference between what's being used, what's simple, and what should be used. You will see a big change in the next five years because we with machine learning, we are able to uh, provide more complicated answers in real time. Okay, okay, it's clear. So, um, so we always have to teach the complicated stuff. We also have to teach that the students use this 10, 15 years from now. If they could only use the information that we teach them for the next six months, they wouldn't have to take our lectures. Kert, even, even for example, the conference that I was attending last, I mean, two weeks, three weeks ago in Oman, the Aramco guys, they, they, they confirmed that even the, within the sun tunes, there are lateral changes of velocity. So all the, the you know, the, the idea of having 1D model is, it's, 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 it's wrong from, but as you said, I mean, in the in the but everyday they still use world, Monday modeling programs. Yeah, they still use Monday modeling programs. Look, go back to this diagram. This is the field instrumentation and the field data. 
The industry has grown to a point where they acquire so much data and through data redundancy, you can use simplified algorithms to come up with a good image. Yeah. So you can use 1D results, but you have to acquire a lot of data and the data redundancy allows you to see lateral changes, but the equations are still too simple. Yep. You get it? Yep. So that's what you saw at the conference. I'm without knowing what you saw. Okay, here is a picture of some anisotropic rock. This is a road cut in Utah. Two meters is about this dark area here. That's about the size of a man. Logging tool uh, resolution is usually um, three foot, which is one meter. And you can see that the layering is sub logging tool resolution scale. And uh, to look at this reservoir scale is about 20 meters. Uh, here we have an image log for 20 meters. Yellow are the sands, these are resistivity logs, darks are the shales. And when we go down in scale, we see anisotropy at every scale. This is a, uh, this is a, 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 a tall uh, uh, um, Zulu warrior, two and a half meters. Um, um come on this is uh, uh 25 centimeters and two and a half millimeters this is uh, scanning electro microscope and you can see at every scale you have an anisotropy because the scale is inherent to the depositional environment so this tells you that the mistakes we are doing are always there now we can quantify those mistakes numerically and they are between 20 to 50 percent but still, knowing those mistakes, we are still getting very, very good results. So what Pantele said is perfectly correct, but it's our job to keep improving the data to get lower cost um, oil production and to reduce the carbon footprint of oil production. Um, um, and this is going to be our goal in the next uh, decades to come. Now, when we measure from the surface, we have this layering, and this is a typical environment where you have shale beds, shale beds. You see my pointer? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Sir, yes. And here are the sands. And so what we have done is we put at two kilometers, two thin reservoirs, oil reservoirs or CO2 reservoirs are 50 meters thick and they are resistive. And so we have um, um, two models, one model, which is the half space, which everything has the same resistivity. And we measure this with a magnetic field from the surface. And we can see no difference between the um, um, hydrocarbon reservoir model and um, between uh, the reservoir not being there. If we measure, electric fields and electric field look at the vertical current flow we are now looking at the vertical resistivity so we're making directional resistivity measurements we are actually seeing this this is just my girls in the background that get excited when a boy walks by outside on the street uh, nothing i can do about it as soon as the boy's gone the girls are quiet um and um uh, it's just like uh, the electric fields. Uh, uh, the dogs are like the electric fields. They respond strong, strongly to the reservoir, like the electric fields, like the dogs respond to somebody walking by in front of the house. Um, so layering itself causes anisotropy. Um, uh, thin layers amplify the effect of anisotropy. So it's not that with great depth, thin layers get smaller yes the amplitude gets smaller but not the anomaly so the relative anomaly gets larger of thin highly anisotropic layers um, and in this case we need to use electric fields to measure we measure at the surface horizontal electric fields versus vertical magnetic fields. let's go back this is already talking about the linkage to the surface. Let's go back to the petrophysical parameters. We have a bulk volume of rock, which consists of grains. And here we have the reservoir fluid, which in this case is oil. 
and the grains are generally water wet and the water with uh, surface adhesion is kept around the grain itself. And on the left side, we have a scanning electron microscope picture, and we can translate this picture to a model. And the most simple model consists out of spheres. These are balls stacked on top of each other. And you can calculate for each one of these balls the porosity. And so the maximum porosity you can get with this type of model is 48%. Now, you're in Saudi Arabia, so you're dealing with Saudi Arabian rocks. Saudi Arabia is all, uh, mostly the Saudi Arabian carbonate platform. And carbonates are rocks that are cooked. And after cooking, uh, the pore space porosity is not so important, but fracture porosity is important. So you have many zones in Saudi Arabia where the porosity is higher than 48%. And that means you have fracture porosity because you can calculate by just using the sphere and the uh, volume equation. Uh, this is the volume of the sphere and this is the volume of the sphere minus the, um, uh, this is the volume of the box minus the um, a sphere. And this is essentially the pore space. Um, and you then can, uh, essentially say that if porosities are this high, then you have fractures and you need to use different equations to address that. Nobody uses different equations. Yes, you get better results with different equations, but it gets too complicated. And the simpler we make it and uh, integrate this in the work workflow, the better the quality of our results are. So doing this, you can only find more oil. You can never do a mistake. So this is a guaranteed recipe for you to be successful in your career by finding more oil. So here we have another way. I've said this already two times. The volume consists uh, out of a square box. And this case, you have the matrix volume and the pore space volume. And the pore space volume is a fraction, the porosity, and the matrix is one minus the porosity. So it's a very simple definition uh, and you just have to remember that. Now, um, for unconsolidated, um, um, for unconsolidated rocks, the uh, porosity increases with a larger grain size, which is also obvious. Um, so this is primary porosity. And for uh, secondary porosity, which is fractured porosity, which are percarbonate rocks are among them, or cooked sandstones, then you have secondary porosity that is in many cases dominant. And that is important to understand so you know what equations to use. You also can look at the grains themselves. If the grains are elongated or if the grains are rounded, if the grains are coming out of a riverbed, they're usually rounded. Um, if they are more early deposition, depositional and the water has evaporated, they, become, they are elongated. And so here you have a larger horizontal permeability and a very low vertical permeability. And this is the strongest part of anisotropy. So you have anisotropy in the permeability, but you also have anisotropy in the resistivity. Now let's go to ball measurements. What do we have when we have a reservoir? Here we have the reservoir highlighted. This is the reservoir itself, which has oil at the top and water at the bottom. And it's in a shale formation. And if we make a zoom of this, then um, we um, have essentially here the tight sands. And the tight sands, when we drill, we drill with mud and the mud invades the formation. So in tight sands, you have very little mud invasion. In normal sands, you have mud invasion and then the oil bearing zones. If you have a high porosity, which could also mean more oil in place, then um, I can improve that by putting my earphones on because that way you don't pick up so much 
noise from the dogs because my microphone is close. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, clear. Yes, we can. Okay, works perfect. And so, um, and then of course you have zones, which is the lower leg here, the water bearing leg, where you have the water uh, vertically separated as well as laterally separated. And this is a pure water bearing zone. So you have to determine many parameters to understand these reservoirs correctly. So what do you do? You usually measure with lateral logs. Lateral logs are logs where you inject an electrical current into the ground through um, uh, an electrode. And you use lateral logs in water-based mud and in oil-based mud, which is resistive. You use induction logs where you use a transmitter to inject this into the ground. Um, and come on, guys. Most of you out. So now they are chasing down the other dog in front of the house by going to the side of the fence. Sorry about that. I didn't plan to bring my dogs to the lecture, but they have. Ah, don't worry, Kerr. Come on, come on. So next we are uh, looking at um, Ohm's law and how do we get the resistivity out of it? So. Um, the, the uh, current in Ohm's law, which is J, equals the conductivity of the rock uh, multiplied with the electric field. So if I apply an electric field, uh, a current will flow into the ground based on the conductivity of the rock. This is known as Ohm's law. Um, then we have another um, important parameter which is quite important also for KFUPM because they are doing some uh, secret uh, experiments in the basement that nobody can see. And they are looking essentially about the effects of dielectric polarization, which are the dielectric numbers. This is the uh, standard dielectric number times one of the rock, uh, the relative permittivity, and this is the vacuum one. And um, you're looking at the dielectric displacement, and this means you're looking more at charges. This becomes important at higher frequencies, and the secret of the work uh, done at KFUPM is that they are also analyzing this at lower frequencies that are important to the oil industry. Now, how do we define resistivity or conductivity? And um, we define it as sigma measured in Siemens per meter or the inverse of uh, uh, a MOA, uh, uh, um, in the inverse of ohm meter. And um, so uh, resistivity and conductivity are the inverse of each other. And the specific electrical resistance is measured in ohm meter. The resistance of a resistor is measured in ohm. It's measured in ohm meter because we are taking a unit section here and the area and the length of the rock sample that we're using, this is the normal resistivity we measure uh, with a voltmeter. And then when you multiply it with the area divided by the length, you have an extra linear unit left over. This is meter squared, this is in meter. And so this becomes then the specific resistivity, which is the resistance times the length. And so that's where ohm meter comes from. Now, um, we can look at different rocks and we can see oil is resistive, water is conductive with about one, seawater is 0 0.3 ohm meters. So remember those numbers, one is important, and oil is more than mega ohms. Um, and quartz is even higher than oil, to 10 to the 14. Um, anhydride is a little bit lower. Dolomite is similar high as quartz, uh, and so is calcite. So um, the water resistivity, also known as RW, uh, depends strongly on temperature. So we have different um, salt solutions in water from 58 milligrams to uh, 5,800 parts per million and uh, we get different resistivities. Uh, I'll say a few words about Archie's law. And um, 
I'll skip the equation part of it. So we can say that clean porous rock, no clay or another conductor than pore water, then the rock conductivity or specific resistivity is proportional to the water, uh, water conductivity. So <coughs> the dominant conductor in Archie's law, uh, the first version of it, um, is the fluid. And the rock conductivity is controlled only by water conductivity and the geometry of the water. So we essentially say that a porous rock, the basic resistivity is proportional to the water conductivity. And we introduce with this a formation factor, a proportionality factor F, and it says that the basic rock uh, resistivity is the water resistivity times the formation factor. Then the formation factor is the um, basic rock resistivity divided by the water resistivity. So F is essentially also known as resistivity magnification. Now, the only reason why I explain this because, you know, in the petrophysics community, uh, people always want to look smart and they put up these equations and these buzzwords and you will meet this and you say, what the hell is this? And then you can just go and look this up. And Archie's law um, is nothing else than that the um, um, that F the, is equal to the, um, the magnification factor water uh, uh, bulk resistivity divided by the water resistivity, but it's also uh, two constants. The porosity uh, has a constant at the top, M, which is known as a cementation uh, factor, and another experiment, exp empirical constant A, um, and these constants have to be defined empirically for different rocks. And they are related to this uh, particular graph. Um, and you just fit a straight line to it and then def define these exponents. Partial water saturation, you add then the uh, water saturated rock resistivity that is a fully water saturated rock resistivity the resistivity of the pore water and the apparent resistivity of the partial uh, saturated rock. And uh, then you introduce another um, proportionality factor known as the um, resistivity index. Um, and this gives you an idea about the non-conducting pore content, which is oil and gas. So the formation, uh, the, um, Um, F, the resistivity magnification by the conducting matrix, and I is the resistivity mag uh, magnification by the non-conducting um, part, which is the oil. So for CO2, for CO2 sequestration, I would be more important. Now we've seen this model before, and this essentially, I'll, I'll skip this in the interest of time. I am now going to logging measurements. Uh, logging was invented by Konrad and um, um, Marcel Schlumberger. <coughs> in, they were doing experiments in Elsass uh, in 1920. Oh, no, this is in Normandy. Uh, in Elsass were other logging instruments. And here they were looking for mining prospecting by um, putting a resistivity survey up and combined with the work they did in Elsass, they ended up with a logging tool which would take the surface measurements down hole and they would have essentially two voltage measurement electrodes and the current injection electrodes and they would move this up the hole and that's why this is called a log because they would run it up as a log in a three electrode array that was grounded at the surface. And they were quite successful with this. So until 1932, uh, Schlumberger was doing surface electrical prospecting and borehole electrical prospecting at the same time. And in 1932, they uh, split the company up because they ran out of money and they took money from um, a French geophysical company known as CGG. 
and CGG started, took the surface geophysics and Schlumberger from then on only did borehole geophysics. Um, now let's talk about names for what we've talked about. We have seen several times, we have mud invasion, we pump mud in order to drill, to grease the drilling, and we get an invaded zone if we have a higher porosity, and then we have the virgin zone. We are looking for the resistivity RT of the virgin zone because this tells us about the fluid in the, in the reservoir. And we have adjacent beds which influence the measurements, and these resistivities are called shoulder bed measurements. We have a mud cake, then with time, the mud uh, hardens and um, mud resistivity as well. So we need to determine the mud resistivity, the mud cake resistivity, the resistivity of the invasion zone, RT and the shoulder beds. So you can imagine you have to do many measurements. And with uh, two electrodes, you only get one measurement. Um, and you're injecting a current. So you have to do many more measurements to look at different distances in vertical as well in horizontal direction. Vertical meaning along the borehole, uh, horizontal meaning uh, perpendicular to the borehole. Now with different frequency, we have different penetration. With lower frequency, we go deep into the formation. And uh, with higher frequency, we go shallow into the formation. So the frequencies that are being used in the borehole in most cases are around 20 kilohertz. 3D induction is going up to 200 um, kilohertz and below 1000 hertz, we are talking about conduction Between 1000 and 200 kilohertz, we're talking about induction. And above 200 kilohertz, we need to include the displacement current and we're talking about wave propagation. And then as we go higher, we go into the radar range. Those are all electromagnetic waves. The equations for those are different. Now we have many, many logging tools to measure this. What we measure with the um, low frequency is resistivity. With the inductive tools, we are measuring conductivity. It's the inverse of resistivity, but we are measuring a volume effect. Whereas with resistivity, we are measuring a direct flow. And dielectric constant is a propagation effect. So when we look at dielectric constant that responds also to the conductivity, we are looking at the propagation effect. So combining dielectric constant measurements and conductivity measurements is going to give you a more accurate picture of the borehole. So if you want to link the borehole with core analysis, you want to work in this range. If you want to link the borehole with the surface, you want to work in this range. It's amazing what you can read out of a simple diagram. Huh? So what logging tools do we have? We have case toll tools, which are through casing resistivity tools. And I will talk about this. And we have open hole tools, which are on the right here. Recently, we have seen an increase of dielectric tools that I work in this range. During my time building logging tools, we mostly worked on induction tools, multi-component induction, then the LW doing more recently these. These are the old tools, the normal lateral logs. These are the Schlumberger tools, the normal log. The lateral logs and the lateral tools are tools that were developed in the early 1950s. Um, and these are active tools. They means they have their own transmitter and receiver. We also have passive tools that are self-potential tools. Self-potential measurements are done in every well and they give you an idea where the fluids are and they are passive. They just measure the voltages. The more fluids you have, uh, the more signal you get because you have more uh, water in the fluids. Without fluids, you have no water. And that means electrons flow and you get a stronger signal. So SP is used to find porous zones. I would like to point out that I am avoiding uh, company acronyms, you are getting flooded 
when you work in your field by company acronyms. Those acronyms are there for the sole purpose of marketing and making you believe that the product from vendor A is better than the product from vendor B. The reality is they are all the same because physics doesn't know what vendor physics works for. The physics is always the same. It's just sometimes the way physics is being interpreted that's slightly different. We are now going to um, lateral logs and um, the original lateral logs uh, that were developed, the focus lateral logs that was developed by um, Henri Doll in the late uh, 1940s, beginning 1950s, essentially injects a current in the ground and measures on uh, two electrodes, um, me measures uh, by side current injection, um, it pushes the current squeezes the current together so that you can get finer bad boundaries. And this is known as the LL3 uh, lateral log. So this is already focused by putting currents of the same polarity. And uh, you know, the same polarity, come on, my machine keeps flipping. Um, I used to say it's my apple and my mouse, but the reality is it's somehow my fingers are getting near touch pads. So it's me, I'm the one who screws up this. And um, so in the LL7, which came later, and in the dual lateral log, you inject the current and you have two voltage measurement electrodes. You measure voltage here and there, and you inject as much current that the voltage here is zero. That means you're squeezing this current into a very thin layer and you get finer layering in the formation. And then you measure the current you have injected in the center electrode and the voltage at this electrode. And from there, you know um, the resistance at that particular layer. Remember, it's an apparent resistivity, but the logging company calls that resistance. That's incorrect, but it still works very good. Now, New ways to do this is to look at the old ones and then you simply inject the current and instead of measuring voltages and forcing, you simply measure uncorrupted voltages and uncorrupted second differences. These second differences are, are very important. Now this is my computer. These second differences are very important, which are here. Second difference are the difference between two differences. So you measure this voltage and then the difference between two voltages. Because this is directly proportional to the current flowing away from the logging tool into the formation. So measuring all the voltages, the difference between electrodes and the second difference allows you to do exactly what you can do with hardware, but much more accurately by doing software focusing. And this will require inversion and it requires geophysical data processing. It's unused. We used this for a while and we got fantastic results. The marketing um, departments of certain logging companies were stronger and everybody ended up with using multiple focus tools. Um, and I will show that in the next uh, two slides from now. Now, um, um, I have, of course, my uh, uh, tools are a little bit biased towards uh, um, a Baker Atlas, but um, we are now talking about um, induction, uh, even though it says lateral lock on the slide, this slide is a little bit out of order. So uh, the next slide is really what I need. Um, so let me go to the next slide. So the, the lateral log I'm talking about is the focused lat uh, array lateral log uh, made by Schlumberger, where you have multiple focused arrays and you still squeeze it. You have a, sh a small focused array and you have a large focused array and you are squeezing the currents into the formation 
and you get multiple information out of this. And uh, um, and so everybody converted their tools to the Schlumberger array, despite the Baker array being much better than the Schlumberger array. So after this lateral log example, we are going to the induction tools and normal induction tools have multiple uh, transmitters and this, um, this is mixed up. So this should be transmitter and this should be receiver. You have multiple transmitters and you're essentially putting a signal into these receivers. These receivers are, um, each of them is measuring in a balance. I won't explain what that means, um, but it's important to know that each receiver has uh, a complicated diagram itself consisting out of multiple sensors. And then you measure essentially from multiple transmitters to these receivers and you estimate a, a, a conductivity measurement from this. And depending on the distance between transmit and receiver, you, uh, the name of the tool is, and you, the longer the spacing is from the transmitter, the name of the tool changes. Now, um, in the Baker Atlas array induction version, you have one transmitter and then multiple um, receiver arrays. And um, then these receivers are, are focused so that the information comes up where the red zones are. And then the center of the information is applied to where these red zones are for the multiple uh, receiver arrays. Now, um, here it's a little bit simplified. You have two uh, transmitters and they are, they are inducing a current around them. And the receiver here consists out of two coils that are wound in opposite direction so that the signal in a uniform test formation is equal to zero. So if these transmitters are producing a response, which would be here, and it is different than zero, then it responds directly to the formation around here. So they're looking to the side and it is an estimate of the conductivity to the side of this. Now in the array induction, you use one transmitter and multiple receivers and you use geophysical inversion to obtain the resistivity. Uh, again, much more reliable results than the other way. So the array tools, are the standard tools that are being used by uh, the contractors, um, uh, Baker Hughes, Schlumberger, Halliburton, um, and um, I would hope Weatherford also has a ray induction. So what happens uh, since the distance between the uh, transmitter and receiver is different, so does the data. So this is the 10 inch curve, which sees all of the layering in 10 inches. This is the 120 inch curve, it sees nothing of the layering. <coughs> <coughs> and so they have to apply some uh, focusing in order to get the fine layering to the deep curve. And this is called, known as vertical resolution matched. Just be aware that when you see the data like this, they have filtered applied to get the fine layering from the invasion zone, which is here on the left in the model, all the way into the deep layering there. Here are some results and it shows that you can get essentially using array induction 24% more oil. You have the DPIL being the old induction logging tool, the HDIL being the new one, they have different names now. And you count down the oil bearing zones by looking at the resistivities. The array induction sees higher resistivities because there's more amplifiers, larger thicknesses. And so you calculate the oil initially in place. And by just using a new logging tool, you find 24% more oil. Now this means you're getting more signal out of the, the noise and oil is resistive. So the signal is small. So you can only get more signal out of the noise. That means you can only win in your job. And that means that um, when you 
um, because you're measuring smaller voltages. No new electronics measure smaller voltages. Now we are going now over to anisotropy and Shell recognized this first. They had um, um, a zone in the North Sea and the resistivity went down. That means no hydrocarbons and this is the zone and the gamma ray went up, um, more shales and it kept, the zone kept producing. So they pulled a core and they saw that they had a lot of thin beds and the oil is in the sands, but the shales dominate the resistivity. And so you will misread the reservoir as being water uh, saturated. And then in reality, it is hydrocarbon saturated, which they found out after production test. And so then they funded the development of a tool, uh, which was uh, first built by Baker um, and first run in 1999 and Schlumberger had 2003, uh, very similar tool. I think today Schlumberger has more tools in operation in this than Baker does. And um, uh, it's an expensive tool because the value is very high. Just a little bit anecdotes in 1986, there were publications uh, that showed that you cannot see this with normal induction, but if you measure the uh, resistivity vertical to in this direction, you are of course not doing normal induction. So that publication would only look at the horizontal induction, which predominantly sees the shales. This is the borehole. This is a transmitter and receiver. The sands of high resistivity is low. So you see this by adding vertical current flow and adding horizontal three component uh, transmit and receiver to your tool. And then you can see the resistivities and find more oil. So this exactly was done. And here's the test formation where you have the standard array induction measurements. And then you do the standard uh, uh, 3D uh, induction and um, you compare the results and you see higher resistivities and more resistive zones um, and the vertical resistivity um, the vertical resistivity is even more resistive than the horizontal resistivity in blue. And so this is a significant increase. And in fact, usually the increase in oil in place is 30 to 40% with the 3D induction. And this is laminated pay. Here we have publications from Schlumberger as well as Baker with their 3D induction. And this is the oil saturation in uh, uh, yellow from the horizontal resistivity and orange from the vertical resistivity. And you can see you find significantly more oil and the same in red from the horizontal and in orange from the vertical resistivity on the Baker side. These are each improvements of 40 to 50%. I'll skip this. Um, let's talk about... Um, um, Gerd. Yes, I have to have five more minutes. Yeah, you have five more minutes and then we have one, two minutes per question and we can continue next Sunday, don't worry. I'm done after four slides. Okay. So through, through casing resistivity works like this. This is the casing. This is the formation. You inject the current. The current flows up and down the casing. The casing is 1 million times more conductive. So you have 1 million times more current going up and down the casing. You then want to measure the leakage into the formation. And as I already told you when I talked about the lateral log, if you measure the difference between two electrodes, it's directly proportional to the leakage. So all you have to do is measure the difference at two points, the voltage here, voltage there, the difference between these voltages or the difference between the currents and you know what goes into the formation. So this is a basic principle, except it was the holy grail of logging for 70 years until we built this tool. We have here a well uh, with a standard deep induction. And then we have the uh, through casing resistivity log, which matches the deep induction after the casing is set. And here we have the same one from Schlumberger uh, a little bit noisier than the Baker one, but uh, in principle, most of them are, agree. Um, and they're very similar to the induction log, which was measured before the casing. So through casing resistivity is possible. Now, where are the issues? You need to look at the sensor voltages. 
You measure millivolts with lateral logs, similar at the surface. You measure microvolts with induction tools. With through casing resistivity tools, you measure nanovolts. And in order to go even deeper than that, you uh, um, need to go into the picovolt range. Um, one word about linking to the surface is crosswell. And crosswell works by having a transmitter on one side, a receiver on the other. You inject the current, you measure the voltage. You move the receiver up, you measure the voltage. Each time you connect the receiver and transmitter, you plot the voltage along the entire array path. Then you move the transmitter one down, you move the receiver up again. And you end up with a grid of measurements where you average your uh, resistance measurements and attribute it to the resistivity of the surface. This is done here. And you have the synthetic data and the field data compared. Um, and you can see that there is a, uh, a good result from a log. This is still very shallow um, with, between the synthetic and the field data. Um, and I think with this, I am going to uh, stop and we go to questions. Okay, thank you, Kurt. Uh, now it's, uh, yeah, Lutfi. Uh, thank you, Professor Pantelis. Thank you, Professor Kurt, for giving me uh, time to ask a question. I want to ask about the porosity equation in maybe around page 13. If you explain it at the beginning, uh, can we return back for a moment? Yeah, this equation. Uh, if I'm not wrong here, uh, you mean that two R means uh, uh, um, the length of a cube, right? So you have uh, two R means we have to uh, we have addition of uh, addition between two sphere. Uh, that means that we, we, once we take the cube, we have uh, uh, we, you are calculating you uh, you are uh, um, taking minus of uh, a cube with one sphere or over three multiplied by phi r cube. This is only one sphere. Then you divide by the whole uh, cube. What my question is, we have here so many so many spheres, not only one, but you only take uh, uh, differ differentiating, we, you only minus, uh, you take minus of uh, the whole cube with only one sphere. But we have so many spheres, for example, here. Yes, but that's all the same. Look, the yellow, the yellow outline um, here. This yellow outline is your cube, which is two times r to the power three. Four third pi r to the power three is a sphere. So this minus this is this part, the blue part, divided by the total volume. This is exactly one quarter of this. You see that? Yes, I, I saw. Uh... So you can, you can, it will be the same for all of it because this is supposed to be a model and the model consists out of spheres. So the porosity is per normalized volume of one. So you can take just one of those because you can easily derive the equations. Thank you. So uh, because I'm, I miss the the picture in this picture. For example, we have four spear here. If I'm not wrong, uh, then why don't we uh, do the calculation with two r cube uh, minus uh, four you, times? Uh, four, well, I would four I, I would make that as a homework assignment for the next lecture that you do that yourself and do it for four spheres. The results will be the same. Because uh, okay. the, the porosity is a volume fraction. And if you take one sphere and the equation is correct, the volume fraction will be the same for four spheres because they are all the same. The model is an equally packed uh, spheroid model. It consists out of spheres only. I'm not saying that that's the most realistic model, but that's the model we have. 
I'm just trying to give you an idea that 48% is the maximum porosity that you can get in the biggest porosity in the biggest uh, porosity uh, model. Because any other model that has of different grain sizes, the porosity will be smaller because the big pores will be filled by small grains. Thank you, you got it? Then, Okay, then we don't need to multiply four over three pi r squared by n, which is n is the number of sphere. No, 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 you don't, no, okay. you don't, need, don't need to do that. Okay, thank you, Professor. So, Kirk, one question from Amin. He is asking about the cooked sandstone. What is the cooked sandstone? So, it's, uh, I mean, actually, you know, it's um, when you have, you know, to, to, to have a sandstone, you need high pressure, high temperature. So, that's why it's cooked. It's just how you make rice. Yes, exactly how you make you rice. Take a rice, rice cooker, you put some <laughs> rice in. And you have uh, this type of model. You have grains and fluids, and you cook it, and the water is gone. So some water is evaporated, but not very much. And the rice gets bigger. Wow. So you put two parts of water, one part of rice. And yeah. when you cook it, it's more than three. What the hell is happening here? So in rice, you have pores that are now open and there is no water in it. And because the pore throat, the connection between the grains is closed inside the grain itself. That's why the rice gets bigger. And I was wondering every time about it. <laughs> Thanks for the recipe, first of all. Okay, guys, so thank you all. I will send you, I will share the, the presentation. I will share also the recording. We will continue with Kert next Sunday. Kert, thank you so much. We will talk later. Okay, and of course, I will share also your recording uh, with you. Yeah, so I, give you, you. I, will, I will send you an updated presentation because there were some mistakes that I have to correct. Yeah, don't worry, don't worry. Okay, yeah. take care, guys. Okay. Good night you, and professor. see you on Thank Tuesday. You. Thank you, Professor. Good. Thank you, Professor Pantelis. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.